finished keeper, you finish what you begin. Our provision through the desert, you see it through to the end. Well, you see it through to the end. Lord, our God is ever faithful, never changed. Every we 
Father, thank you so much that you reign faithful and omnipotent, God, that you never change, that you are the same God yesterday, today, and forever. God, thank you that we can put our hope and our trust in you. Thank you that you love us so much, Lord, in spite of ourselves, Lord, that you don't look on our mistakes and you don't look on our problems and in, in disappointment, but with love and grace and mercy and kindness, Lord. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you and are amazed by your love today. We just pray that you would be honored as we worship you, God.
praise by you, by your amazing grace in our lives. We don't deserve it. We are not worthy of it. We can't earn it. But you come to us time and again with unconditional love and forgiveness. Help us to receive that unconditional love and forgiveness and not only to receive it in our lives, but also to share it with others. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to invite you to be seated at this time, and I'm going to invite our young people to come forward. We have our Ignite Children's Ministry going on right now, but I think there's a, a few younger ones here with us, and I'll invite them to come forward at this time, and we'll share in that time together. And uh, as they're coming forward, we also uh, welcome all of you to worship today. It's been a great weekend here. We'll talk a little bit more about what's been going on and uh, share in that time together. All right, well, I think most of you know Pastor Jeff is a, is a big sports fan, all right? So I brought in a few team logos for some different teams. We got a, a Phoenix uh, Sun shirt there. It's a little wrinkled after four worship services, all right? But uh, we root for our local team, Suns, Diamondbacks, Coyotes, Cardinals, all right? We root for all them. Uh, someone in the church is a, is a big Minnesota person, so they brought me back a Minnesota Twins baseball cap, all right? So we share in that. Now, I don't know why I have this, because I don't think they're going to win the Super Bowl for 100 years, but this is a Dallas Cowboys hat, all right? So... <laughs> Sorry to you Cowboys fans. And by the way, I just want you to know, many people have asked me this weekend, and I've taken the high road, why didn't I bring in any Arizona State gear after the game yesterday? Because I preached on forgiveness last week. All right, so I have to practice what I preached despite the game yesterday, which I did already mention. But anyway, all right. So here's the deal. We all have logos of different teams that we like and that we root for, but as Christians, we have logos too. And sometimes we wear them around our neck. It's a cross, and we have the cross up here behind us on the wall, and that is our central symbol. That's our central logo. Now, uh, we're in this special season called Lent, and, you know, um, we're focused on a lot of things. You saw on the Stay Connected, we have a really special devotional by Pastor Matt. We have the opportunity to gather on Wednesday nights for dinner and worship, and we also have the opportunity to gather in small groups, and it's really awesome. I walked around the other day. And there was all these groups meeting on campus, and it was just really cool to see people meeting and discussing their faith. So that's really awesome, and I know there's some going on this morning, and uh, we share in that together. So let's just remember, God's our biggest fan. We need to be God's biggest fan, and as excited as we are about sports, we also need to be excited about God. So let's pray together. Lord, we are so grateful that you are with us today, so grateful that you are in our midst, and so grateful for the season of Lent, and we're so grateful that we can all stand at the cross. Help us to remember that the cross is our central symbol, our central logo uh, that we all gather around and that we focus on. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Appreciate you guys coming up, and you can head on back. Now, normally at this point, we would do a sharing of the peace, but it's been an awesome weekend uh, here at La Casa, and I hope you all received one of these when you came in. We have our largest new members class that we've had since the pandemic began, uh, 40, almost 40 folks in one new member class, and we're grateful for that. We've been receiving them at all of our services this weekend, and so um, I'm going to invite those that are at this worship service to come forward and join me up here, and we're going to face the congregation. So if you won't be bashful and come up, I know there's four or six of you here. Uh, so come on up. All right. Come on down. And I would really encourage you as members to read through these bios, look at the pictures, and uh, greet these individuals and greet these new faces with us. We have people joining us from all generations, all walks of life. We've been receiving them again at all four of our worship services, and we're grateful to have you all with us. So, you know, the Apostle Paul wrote these words, and he said these words, he says, we all have different gifts. Uh, we're not all the same, but we're all united and focused in the body of Christ on Jesus Christ. So at this time, I'm going to ask you, is it your intent? Attention to join this congregation and share with us as we seek to serve in God's kingdom, focusing on peace and justice and love in this city, in this nation, in this world as God's people. Is it your desire to do that? If so, would you answer yes by the help of God? And will you, as existing members and friends of La Casa de Cristo, will you work side by side and hand in hand with these people as together we seek to serve our community and reach out to all with the good news of Jesus Christ, uh, to love others as Jesus has loved us, and to also help us grow in our faith? If so, would you answer, yes, by the help of God? May we all stand for our prayer at this time as you're so able. Lord, uh, we are grateful grateful for the opportunity to serve together, 
grateful for this large new members class that has come to us and grateful that we move forward together in faith. As we gather, may we continue to work for your kingdom on earth. Keep our focus on you. Keep our eyes on you in all that we say and do. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we hear it for these new members this morning? Thank you. Welcome, welcome. And as we, uh, as we welcome these individuals and welcome all who joined at our other services, let's take this opportunity to greet them and greet one another. Let's share the peace of God with each other. Let's move out of our seats and greet a new face. Welcome. At this time in our worship service, uh, we are going to continue with our reading from Scripture, and our reading today and the focus of our message is from the 23rd Psalm. It's found on page 392 in the Pew Bible, the 23rd Psalms. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me besides quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will feel, feel no, fear no evil. For you are with me, and your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Here ends the reading. Grace and peace to you from God, who is our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who also gives us the promised presence of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Julia and her husband were faithful members of a church I served over 25 years ago in Central Phoenix, and they were faithful members there every week involved in the life of the parish. Until the weekend that they went up to Wickenburg camping, and a propane gas tank exploded, severely burning Julia's legs. And Julia never came back to church after that. And despite my attempts to engage her as her pastor, she was very, very angry at God for what had happened in the accident. And I clearly remember the words that she spoke to me. She said, Pastor, if God is a God of love, then why did he allow this to happen? Last week, we tackled the tough subject of forgiveness in our lives and how we need to forgive each other, even though we often don't want to do that. And today, we're going to really look at this subject of suffering in our lives, and we've explored it at all of our services, because if God is love, then what about suffering in our lives? What about suffering at the time of a diagnosis of a disease in our life or a, a medical problem? Or what about a painful separation in our life through the death of a loved one or through a divorce or a broken relationship in the family? What about a situation of an accident or a tragedy where something comes winging completely out of the blue? And how do we handle that as people of faith? And how do we deal with this whole concept of suffering? Now, I'm not going to be arrogant or presumptuous enough to believe that in the next few minutes, I'm going to solve and fix the answers that people have wrestled for with millennia over the issues of suffering and faith and how we believe in God and how we deal with it. But I want to approach this today candidly and understand that it's something we can and should discuss and wrestle with in our lives. Because when we look at people in the scripture, they aren't these plaster saints 
saints. They were people that struggled. Jacob literally wrestled with God until he was given the name Israel. We look at people like Esther, people like Ruth, people like Moses. They all, at one point or another, suffered in their lives, and they, they doubted, and they struggled, and the same is true for you and me. And I'm going to give you three statements today, three statements that we cannot reconcile with each other. We can reconcile two of the three, but it's really hard to reconcile all three. God is all powerful. That's the first statement. God is all good. That's the second statement. And the third one is evil stuff happens in our life and the life of the world. You can reconcile two of those statements. God is all powerful. God is all good. Evil stuff happens, but it's hard to reconcile all three. So how do we do this? Using the 23rd Psalm as a launching pad, I want to begin and end with that today. Because often we only hear the 23rd Psalm at the time of a funeral or a memorial service. But that psalm is a psalm for the living. It's not a psalm for the dead. It's a psalm for the living. And I want to zero in on those words that that Brenda spoke for us this morning that are so key in this psalm. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadows of death, I will fear no evil because you are with me. You are with me. And I want you to remember that as we move through these next few minutes together. God is with us. Now, here's the reality with suffering in our lives. We all come from different perspectives. And we always have different perspectives. And sometimes we think our perspective is the only one and everyone should just agree with us. But I learned the hard way a number of years ago when someone shared something with me they were really excited about. It was a solution to their problem, but I didn't really take it as a compliment. And, and the story was this couple was in church and they had a seven-year-old named Ryan who was really fidgety. Now, we know kids are always fidgety. We love kids in church. That's just the way children are. They're fidgety, right? But Ryan was really fidgety and the, the parents were really self-conscious about this. And so I noticed for about three weeks that Ryan was really quiet and and, and really well-mannered in his pew, and he wasn't fidgety at all. And the mom and dad came up to me after that worship service before I had a chance to say anything and said, Pastor Jeff, we found out the solution to make Ryan stop fidgeting. I said, oh yeah, what's that? And I said, well, we just told him a couple weeks ago that uh, if he doesn't stop fidgeting, you're going to lose your place in your sermon and have to start it all over again. (laughs) And uh, that got him to stop. Now, They thought that was a good thing. I didn't necessarily take it as a compliment, but that's the way it goes. We all have different perspectives, right? So when it comes to suffering, here's a couple of different perspectives. First of all, some of the suffering in our life is self-induced. It's self-induced. We brought it on ourselves because of foolish actions or words that we've spoken. Some of it's self-induced. And you and I know this. And and then we fall into that woe is me pattern and how horrible things are. And we fail to put things in perspective that in our lives right now, we're not in a bomb shelter in the Ukraine wondering if our family is going to survive. What we deal with mostly are first world problems. But some of the sufferings brought on by ourselves, some of the suffering in our lives is imposed upon us by the sins and choices of other people. And we don't have any say in the matter. And, and we may suffer innocently in that way. We, we, we are not responsible for that. And sometimes, sometimes there is just a suffering in our life that we cannot understand. We don't understand it. There is a mystery to it. I have encountered for over three decades uh, the intersection of people's lives at horrible moments of their lives, times of great tragedy, times of of terrible circumstances, times when uh, there are no words that can be spoken. But in those moments, I've seen the glimmers of faith that are still there. And here's the reality. God is to us like a loving parent. Now, If God created us and put us in this hermetically sealed room with purified air, purified drinking water, no sharp edges in the room, we could live that way and we could be God's puppets. But God gave our first parents and us choices. And in those choices, there are good and bad choices. And you know, Adam and Eve weren't struck by lightning when they reached for the apple. They were given a choice by God. And so just as we taught kids to ride a bike and knew they might fall off, or they climb a tree and break an arm, or they're driving and get into an accident. 
So in the same way, things happen in our lives and and that's the way it is with God, but God doesn't stop loving us. And so the first thing I want to encourage us to do today is be honest about those moments. The people in the Bible were honest. When they doubted, when they struggled, you need to work it out. You need to pray about it. You need to talk to trusted friends or a small group or a Bible study about it. You need to go to people you trust in your life to work through your problem and, and to work through that moment of doubt and struggle in your life. And, and it's okay to do that. God's not going to zap you for that. He didn't zap Adam and Eve. He's not going to zap any of us for that. We can question, we can wrestle, we can struggle. That's first. But in that, there's some scriptures that come to mind that we need to keep in the forefront of us. And of course, Psalm 23 is one, recognizing God walks with us always, but there's some other ones as well. The ninth chapter of Mark, when the man comes to Jesus and says, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Sometimes we will doubt, sometimes we will struggle. We shouldn't go down the road Julia went down where we turn our back completely on God and forsake him. That's not the answer either. But what we have to understand is really the nature of God. And the nature of God is, if we believe the gospels, God is love. God is good in our life. I remember once having a conversation with my father and we were talking about the fact I never met my paternal grandmother because she died at the very young age of 54. But I remember my dad sharing with me, he went to his mom's funeral and the pastor was there saying, well, it was God's will that Ruth be taken from us. And he wanted to stand up and say, that's a big bunch of bull. Because the reality is it's never God's will. It's never God's will that he punishes us or harms us or arbitrarily takes something out of our lives. The nature of God is good. And if we can't believe that God is good for us, if we don't believe those words that, that Sam had to speak at the beginning of the service, then we can't believe in Good Friday. We can't believe in Easter if we don't believe that God is good. So then what about suffering? Well, Here's where we come to the second part. How do we invest our time and energy? It's kind of like life. You and I know people, it's always woe, and me, woe is me, my life's horrible, they're always looking only to themselves, how terrible things are for them, how mean everyone is to them. They're always down in the mouth about stuff. And in the same way in our faith, we can cook up these grand conspiracy theories about God. God is against us. God doesn't like us. God doesn't forgive us. God doesn't love us. And we come up with these grand conspiracy theories about God, and they're not true. And we believe them. And we delude ourselves into thinking that. Rather, maybe the question is this, how are we spending our time on earth as we wrestle with these things? All of us are going to be wounded. All of us are going to be suffering. Some of you may be suffering right now. Some of you may be going through things right now in your family or in your life or in your faith, and that's okay but how are we gonna spend our time? Is it only a focused self-obsession or is it something else? Do we have a responsibility to receive the love of God and then share that with others, even if we're struggling? Across the years, there's one other scripture passage that has become more meaningful for me. And it's often read at the time of a wedding, but it's actually the verse before this famous verse where Paul writes to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 13. Now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. But the verse preceding that is one that we need to take note of as human beings. Paul writes this, we see in a mirror dimly, one day we will see face to face. Now we are only partially understanding and being understood. One day we will be fully understood and fully understand. We see in a mirror dimly. 
I'm not going to give you the answer this morning to the existence of human suffering in your life, my life, or anyone else's life. No one, no human being can ever solve that. But what I can point you to is to the cross of Jesus Christ. And there on the cross, our Lord went through the same things that you and I go through. And he cried out at one point, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And if our Lord, God's son, felt abandoned, if he felt frustrated, if he felt doubt, if he felt suffering, then so will we. But note what Jesus said, my God, my God, the relationship is still there. Yea, though I walk through the valley of shadows, you are with me. I read a pretty profound book lately by Brandon Meeks. And in this book, Brandon Meeks says, there is a, a building, and you'll understand what it is in a second here. There is a building that all Christian churches should model themselves after and should heed a few lessons from. And this building, it has a yellow sign and black letters in the letters, are usually broken, like the people inside the building. And if you walk inside this building, you would always be greeted with a smile. You would be greeted personally, a lesson all of our churches can use, greet one another with love, with grace, with a smile. And then as you look around this building, you'll see a, a variety of people, a variety of ages and circumstances. You might see in this building a family that's gathered there for a few minutes before their parents are going to have to go work another shift so they can pay rent. And over in the corner, you may see some Vietnam veterans talking with some bikers, and they're talking over their life problems and their stories. And then over in another corner, there's maybe a very elderly couple, and their children have moved out of state, and their friends are all long dead and buried, and they go to this place just because they're lonely, and so they can hear the voices of others. And everyone dresses differently in this place. Some people are in business suits. Some people are in jeans. Some people are even wearing their pajamas. And some of the people there are drunk. And some of them are sober. And some of them are somewhere in between. But Brandon Meeks writes in his book, The Gospel According to the Waffle House, that our churches could all stand to heed a lesson from that because there, everyone is not judged. They are loved unconditionally, and accepted for who they are. Maybe in the midst of our suffering, we need to see that glimmer of light that God always walks with us. And then with that glimmer of light, understand that with that love and mercy that he's poured out upon us, that we are still called, despite our own suffering, to pour it out upon others. And it's easy to wallow in self-pity, and it's easy for us as God's people to point only to our own suffering and woe is me. But it's much harder to see that upon the cross, that authentic relationship is still there. My God, my God, he is still our God. And we won't have all the answers this side of heaven. But we have Jesus Christ. What more do we really need? Amen. We worship this morning at this time with our morning offering. I'm going to call the band uh, back up, and we're going to lead into our musical offering. And let's take our offering time not only as a time when our monetary offerings are received, and we know some give electronically as well, uh, but that uh, we share in a time of the offering of our lives and, and focus on that 23rd Psalm in our life together.
to the cross I cling Of its suffering I do drink Of its work I do sing On it my Savior Both bruised and crushed Show the God is love That God is just At the cross you beckon me To walk me gently to my knees And I lost for words so Lost in love I'm sweetly broken Holy surrender come to you in prayer this morning and we pray for all of us as God's people for the world for our nation and for all people according to their needs as we gather this morning we often confess that we have often desired more explanations from you in our life than we desire your presence help us to know and see and feel your presence through your Holy Spirit in our lives not just one time not just on Sunday mornings, but each and every day of our lives. As we gather today, we are also ever mindful of the fact that in our lives, we often want to avoid trouble, but help us to see that indeed you are a very present help in a time of trouble in our lives. Help us to understand that and to know it and to live it in our lives. God, as we gather today, there are also many needs in our congregation, those that are anticipating surgery, those who are in hospice care, those who are recuperating at home, those also who have lost extended family members and loved ones. Particularly this day, we lift up to you two members of our congregation who have been received home by Jesus this week. 
We lift up to you Roger Collison, who is now in your arms, and we pray for Elaine, his wife. We also lift up to you the family and friends of Pastor Ken Dowgs, who went home to you as well this week. And we lift up to you his wife, Helen, and his children. We pray for Hank and Susan and Danny and Lisa and David and Chris and their grandchildren. As these families grieve, O oh God, help them to be surrounded by your mercy and your love. And there's many others in our midst going through challenges, challenges with their health, challenges at work, challenges at home, challenges in relationship. Help us to always seek your word and apply that to our lives in all these situations. God, for all these gifts, we are grateful. Grateful for the rain that's come today, even though we may grumble about the weather. Grateful for the sun when it shines. Grateful for all things which come by your hand. And we pray the prayer you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Before we share in our closing song and our benediction, just a few quick reminders. We will gather as God's people here in this place, the gathering place, on Wednesday evening. Dinner's at 5.45, and we worship and have our children's ministry at 6.45 p.m. And then also a reminder that in about 20 minutes, we'll begin our congregational annual meeting, and the annual reports are back by the Welcome Center for you to pick up and to share in that time together. We'll be beginning at 11.45. Now may we all rise and stand as we're able as we receive the benediction and share in our closing song. May the Lord bless us all and keep us all. May the Lord look upon us with his mercy, smile upon us and give us his grace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where the streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name in the desert place. Thank you.